One sec, okay. Hi everyone, today is March, or sorry, April 21st, 2020, and um, my name is Sinead Willihan, and I'm here on Grant Cameron's channel with Grant Cameron, and also our interview subject today, Mike Patterson, who is a fellow Ontarian. I am in Toronto, Canada. Mike is a couple of hours north of me. And uh, Mike has been doing some really in-depth research for about seven years now, specifically on Sasquatches, but there's a lot of other stuff happening around that. And um, so we just thought this would be a great topic of conversation, considering that Mike's research is directly in line with consciousness and how uh, different paranormal uh, occurrences such as Sasquatches and, and all of the incredible things that come with them, how they directly um, are in line with Grant and my interest in raising consciousness and benefiting the planet and humanity. So Grant, hello. Hello, Sinead. Uh, welcome and welcome to Mike. Hello, uh, Sinead and Grant, and it's, it's great to be here. And, and I just want to say, too, it's actually, I'm in, I'm in almost a dozen years. It's been about seven years of ongoing contact, so at this point. Uh, oh. Thank you for the clarification. Sorry for that error. And um, I thought that we could just let you introduce yourself a little bit, give people some background on what you're doing um, with your, web, your amazing website, Sasquatch Ontario, and the incredible research you're doing. And then we can go from there into your origin story, how you got into this to, to begin with. So please take it away in any way you'd like to. Okay. Um, yeah, first, uh, I have a website up, sasquatchontario.com, and I have a YouTube channel, I think there's about 70 plus videos on there at this point, and um, it's been documenting ongoing contact, which has been over the past seven years. Um, <clears throat> I just, uh, I got involved in this after spending time in the forest. You know, I was uh, spending my spare time with a camera, I bought some good camera gear. I love nature, I love going into the forest, and I would take my, uh, well, my girlfriend at the time was, um, she was working every weekend, so I'd be off into the woods with my camera looking for wildlife and photographing nature and, you know, something I got pretty good at. And then crazy stuff happened one day. <laughs> so what, yeah. is, what is this pretty neat stuff that ended up happening? Like, how did all of this begin for you? Of course, it's the perfect setting that you're already on your own out there in nature, um, which is where they like to appear apparently, although you know much more about that than I do. Um, so how did this exactly start and when? Uh, this, it, it would have started back in about uh, 2012. And I had this epiphany, you know, I'd, be, I'd been in the forest and doing my thing and photographing wildlife. And then one day I just had this epiphany about searching for Sasquatch. And at this point, after all this experience, what's been shown to me and revealed, and um, I believe there was some, uh, uh, I, I think they had some hand in that thought entering my mind. You know, I've, I've learned a lot since then, and as, as you both understand, this is all consciousness related, and it's, um, it's shown me some absolutely incredible things over the years. Um, it was, uh, I just lost my train of thought there. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'll help to bring you back. Um, let's start with the very first time you realized that something strange or unusual was happening. What, what happened and what was the experience like for you overall, emotionally, mentally, you know, in general, what was it like? Well, the, the very first three times I went searching for them, this is after I had this epiphany, right? I went up into the Bon Echo region um, up in uh, northern, just uh, I think north of Belleville, roughly. So I was up in that area. Uh, employer I was working for at the time had a, a cottage on Lake Mississaugan. And on the other side, there's cottages on one side. And on the other side, it's all, it's all woods. There's nothing there. And he told me about a camp spot that uh, snowmobilers use sometimes. So I had to drive down this logger road to get there. And I went with a, a good friend of mine. This was the very first time. So it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, we were, uh, sorry, that's my cat. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. And we were standing there. You know, I had some breakfast and stuff. And, and we, we started hearing this screaming off in the distance. And 
at this point, now I understand, you know, this was a, this was Sasquatch. There's nothing else that makes a, a sound like this. It was something that just went on and on. And, and I actually found a video online after I, I come home and started searching and, and I found something very similar. So it was the, the very next time I went searching for them. Um, I went into an area that was entirely unexpected. I could, I, I'd made a comment on a YouTube video to somebody uh, on a Sasquatch video and I, I got, a, there was a response from somebody and, and he said, Hey, you want to go to an area where there's been previous activity? And, and he named the area, which I, I don't want to name it right now, but um, I was very skeptical. I was extremely skeptical because I always thought one had to go to the West Coast to you know, experience something like this. And I found it different. So I ended up meeting this guy about a month later. And this is in, uh, you know, this would be north of Toronto. And it was about uh, uh, 12 noon when we met. And four and a half hours later, he picks up a rock, but a fifth size rock walks up to a pine tree and, and bangs on it a few times. And right away, Almost immediately, I, I heard this uh, rapid triple chest thump kind of sound, and I, I spent enough time in the forest. It it just it hit me as extremely odd, and we just stopped dead and and we were we were quiet. And then it was just a few seconds later, I got this giant guttural three whoops that filled the forest. He sounded about ten feet tall, and it was close. Didn't there was no visual or anything, but as soon as I heard that. That, that moment changed my life right there. That, that's when I knew they were real. And when you hear them vocalize like that, there's no question about what it is. So, and, and I actually went back the next week by myself into the same general area, and I ran into them again because I heard the exact same triple chest thump tone, and then I had a weird experience where I ended up in my vehicle halfway home um, not understanding how I got there. Wow. They were close and they, I think they sent me away. They have this ability and that's not the first time this has happened. Um, something where, you know, your mind is messed with or whatever it is that they do infrasound or I don't know. Do you find that that's, that's really interesting? Like I haven't heard anybody and I've watched a few um, Sasquatch related videos in preparation for this interview. And I've never seen anyone say that they had time loss. Is that something that in your research you found is common for people who experience this particular phenomenon? Um, yeah, it, it is actually quite common that they, um, again, I, I, you know, I believe this is consciousness related. Um, not necessarily infrasound there you know it could be an aspect of both I'm not sure but I have spoken with uh, numerous others that uh, have had these strange experiences Wow! and how much time actually passed when you had the time loss how much time did you lose um, I basically walked out of the forest got in my car and I was driving maybe for 15 20 minutes before I realized you know, my thoughts came back and I was like, wait, wait a sec. I was just back there and I know they were there because I had that exact same experience without the, the, the guttural whoops, but I know they were very close. And so I, I guess I lost that bit of time, 20 minutes or so, walking to my vehicle and then leaving before I realized. Okay. And then how have things progressed since that day? Like, or since those early experiences, what's, I know this is a very big question, but like how in a sort of general way, as we start the interview right now, um, would you say that things have progressed or changed? I, I spent about the next four years going into that same area. And at this point, I think they were waiting till I gathered enough experience and understanding. And I, and I persisted. I was in there every weekend for the first year and maybe every second weekend for the second year. And I continued that and I had numerous experiences and numerous experiences in multiple locations. Um, and it was a, after about four years, I had this situation come to me and basically fall into my lap of a, uh, a location, a, a private property up in the Kawartha Lakes region in Ontario here. And 
and I've been working with the property owner ever since. So it's, uh, we're in about seven years now. And the, the contact that we've developed over that time is just it's ab absolutely phenomenal. I'm, I'm at this point where I'm putting down a pad of paper and a, and a chalkboard on the table inside the cottage. When I get there, I ask a question. We walk outside. I come in. I have answers written down. Wow. So it's, wow. This has been amazing. Inside your home. Inside your own home. Um, I, it's funny. I, I haven't, I've, I have stuff that happens at home, but it's not as developed as it is there. I believe it's more developed there because of the, uh, uh, it's their home. It's their home base. Has the property owner seen stuff? Is he, is he, was he aware of this before you got there? Yeah, he was actually searching for somebody to come in and do investigations because of, uh, they suspected for about five years before I got there that they had activity going on. And then one day his father, uh, Bill, who's passed away now, uh, he sat up in bed and, and there was a Sasquatch standing right outside the window with his back to him. And uh, he basically got up, went to the bathroom, come back and he was gone, right? But they've had instances like uh, being on the snowmobile and uh, this, is, this is one story that they told me. Um, Dwayne is his name and his girlfriend uh, noticed a pair of uh, red eyes, no body, and following them as they're flying on a, on a snowmobile, you know, and keeping up with them. So there, there's a lot of a lot of strange stuff with this. Oh, that's amazing. So um, the reason why I asked if things were happening inside your home is, first of all, I saw you uh, either read about it on your website or saw you talking about it, that there's been some um, bizarre stuff happening with the camera that you put down on the table inside your house, but you had said you would put a pad of paper on a table, and so that must be an outdoor table somewhere or some kind of outdoor surface where they're able to respond. So do you, do you ever witness it? Like when, when you ask a question and then the answer appears on the paper or in some other form, can you see it occur in front of you? Or is it that you, you walk away for a minute, you turn away for a minute, and then you look back and then suddenly it's there? When, when we started, I was putting a little pad of paper and a crayon out on the ledge outside, um, just outside the door of the cottage, and we were getting scribbles on it. And this has developed over time. And the same was with the camera because we've been getting imposed images. That started in the forest and then developed over time where everything now is put on the table inside the cottage. So um, at this point, when I ask questions, like the, the last visit that we were up there because of this COVID-19 thing, um, the first thing I asked was, uh, did Duane, does Dwayne or myself have this virus that's going around the world right now? <laughs> and they wrote, not yet. So that was a little, you know, uh, disconcerting there. But um, we've had a, a couple of times, like we tend to ask a question and we'll go outside and we'll come back in. And there's either drawings, writing, uh, and it's in, in uh, both English and other language and uh, drawings. Um, but we have had a couple of incidents where it's happened while we were in the cottage. We didn't notice it. They won't do it right in front of our face, not yet. Um, but we were sitting there. This this is a, a couple visits back. We're sitting there. Dwayne's in the kitchen. I'm in the living room. It's right there. The, the kitchen table's right there. Everybody can see everything. And uh, and suddenly, and I know it's I know it's on the pages, right? Because the last thing I do before we exit the cottage, I check every page on that sketch pad. And the first thing. I do when I walk in that door as I check every page on that, uh, on that sketch pad. So I know what's in, in there. I'm very, very diligent about that. So we were sitting there, um, uh, one visit, this is a more recent visit and, and Dwayne, he was standing in the kitchen. Suddenly he said, that, you know, I just heard paper shuffle and I walk over and I check and sure enough, there's a brand new drawing there. We've had, we've had a lot of activity happen inside the cottage where there's been physical contact, a ports, and a ports at this point is just absolutely hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, marbles have been dropped right into my hand. I, I caught one, I, I remember watching one of your uh, uh, presentations there, Grant, how you stated how difficult it was to capture and port on video. Well, I got one. Is that right? <laughs> with the, 
Yeah, when I, when Chris Munch was there and he was, we were standing outside. I think it was, I don't know what time. It might have been two o'clock in the morning. It was late, and uh, he asked if I wanted to interview him. So I was in the midst of doing that when a red marble dropped from thin air between us, and uh, we actually shut the camera off at that time and checked my vehicle, which was right there beside us, and uh, it, it had a layer of uh, condensation on it, but there was a, a fresh sasquatch handprint there you know with all the hair markings so the this is this is very common with the activity that we are experiencing there so what, what kind of apports have you got and and in, especially in terms of marbles because i had the one with chris blatzo the ufo experiencer who had 40 marbles we've probably ended up with about 1500 between us over the course of this um i, I get things like uh you know, I like this rock here. Okay. Um, th this would, uh, I pulled up in a visit. I opened my car. I jumped out. I just got there. You know, I had to relieve myself. So I just yeah. stood there at the side of the, the road. And, you know, it was, what, 30 seconds later, and I turn around this rock sitting on my seat. Or I have another one with a, a another stone about this size just over there. And it, and it was after uh, winter when all the snow had melted. So we're walking around looking for uh, marbles that we might have missed over the winter. And, and there's this uh, little piece of granite. It was sticking out of the road a little bit. It was sitting in a divot. And, I, and there was a red mark on it. So I, I picked it up. I took a look at it. And then I pushed it back into the divot in the road. I walked into the cottage. Dwayne's still down the road. I... He didn't know anything about this. So I walked into the cottage. I have a, my camera bag, and I w went into my camera bag, and there's that exact stone that I just picked up and put back in the divot sitting in my camera bag. Have you got, have you got a lot of these photographs on your website of the, the Aport stuff? Um, throughout the videos, yeah. you know, I've photographed. I've hand-woven gifts. We've received a bunch of those that uh, you can tell they're made from um, different individuals, younger, more mature. So these uh, little kind of, uh, they, they, they use this hollow stem um, plant material and, and twist and turn them and make these uh, little, little hand-woven gifts that they've given to. Well, what's your, what's your take on reports? Why do you think they're doing this? To show presence. Okay. It's basically just, hey, we're here. Yeah. And th this is, uh, th they, have, they have many ways that they, they show their presence. Uh, you know, physical contact, or you might get a telepathic voice speak in your head. Or um, there was uh, an incident where we put the camera on the table, uh, the viewfinder was sticking up like uh you know facing upwards and i'd asked to see a handprint from the the younger individual uh neff's little sister and we were standing in the cottage and Dwayne suddenly points to the the camera he says look um there was three fingerprints that appeared and there was condensation on them and we stood there and we watched it dry up right in front of our face you know it was just seconds it was they were that fresh and then they left three oily finger marks wow and you, you've had that happen with footprints too right well you you're outside and a fresh footprint will appear very close by where you had just been there in that area and you just had the camera and the light on the ground there was no print there for example right next to your car and then all of a sudden there is a print there That's yeah we, we've documented hundreds of prints there and they, they're all given to us purposely some of them are minutes old um, some of them are even seconds old, and um, there was a more recent visit this winter where uh, I'd gone to leave some food up at the gift tree. There's an incline there, and that levels out. All this activity that we're experiencing, we're not in the forest. We're outside the forest. We're basically on the gravel road right out front of the cottage. And so um, when, when I go do that, you know, we're always checking for footprints, right? We're very thorough and I come down and I you know I'm always scanning the ground and there was nothing there and then suddenly there was a this this one was great because it was 18 inch footprint so you know that's a very large individual possibly upwards of 10 feet tall 
and that just appeared right in front of my vehicle and then we we're looking for more and we we're standing there we, we just walked this little this little area and we're standing by my car and suddenly Dwayne pokes me and he goes don't don't step back and I look and and there's a another fresh footprint from a younger younger individual that um, that just appeared that wasn't there seconds earlier because we just walked across that spot right and they're very blatant prints you know they 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 stick right in so you you mentioned a name uh, who are we dealing with do you, do you have you given them names do you know, is it a family do you, who are you, you actually dealing with is it a group of it's, teams it, it is a family and when I first started um, making the visits there and and understanding that we were being watched you know I, I hadn't I, I just left myself open I didn't realize what they were capable of at the time right not at all um, I remember the first time I said to Dwayne I said I think they're invisible he thought I was nuts um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so when I, I would uh, I would sit there and, and I, I pat my chest and I go Mike I'm Mike and I just kept doing that and and showing him how to form my name with you know with my mouth and that and i did that for months and finally one day uh they gravitate to my audio and i record absolutely every visit um, throughout the night right so we were playing the audio back in the car on the drive uh back home and uh, neff's voice he, he speaks right into the the microphone he says uh, mike Dwayne nefetia so he finally told us his name after months of doing that. And then he actually said, Anastasia, sister. So I have, uh, we have a couple other names. Um, Dwayne's gotten the name Ninyanin, which I believe is uh, one of the, the little children. Um, I asked for the mother's name. I, it, I was given writing that says Omra, O-M-R-A. Um, so there, there's been a few names given, and and there's a, there's a minimum a half a dozen family members at at the bare minimum. I don't know how many exactly at this point. And and what do you think they're doing there? And most importantly, what do they want you to do? Why why are they interacting? Have they got a message for the world, or do they want something known? I had an experience. Um, well, first of all, they've. Uh, believe they've been there throughout Dwayne's entire life so okay. um, I believe that I may have been brought in there to just help connect them with with the family and also I've been given the experience and I was fully awake when this happened it was a telepathic experience with a an image and words that were felt it, it, this experience allowed me to understand that they do not need to know language. They can feel words with clarity. And this is what they gave to me. And they showed me an image of dozens of them all walking across an open meadow, all in the same direction. And it was followed by the words. They're very abrupt too, very, um, in all their activity that I've experienced at this point. But it was followed by the words, soon your people will know. And there was there was clarity bar none with that. It was, um, very concise and this was uh, about four years ago uh, last month four years March so I believe that they are giving this to me personally to they want people to speak to speak out and share their experiences they are exposing their existence to us they're doing it, doing it as they choose obviously um, they're very very intelligent they're they're far past us and they're and their uh, cognitive abilities and um, I believe they, they, they want people like myself to share their experiences to help dispel myths and, and fear because there is a lot of fear out there in this subject. What do they say about fear? I'm sorry? What do they say about fear? Do they have a message about fear? Um, they, they've never really said anything to me about it but the, they just, they, they don't want us to fear, fear them. I, I know that um, they hold themselves back because their visual scares the hell out of people, yeah. right? So the more people that, uh, and, and I've been uh, gaining a lot of uh, acquaintances and, and speaking with numerous people that are suddenly getting the same experiences, you know, suddenly they have Sasquatch 
banging on their door basically and and wanting to connect with them and this is happening a lot it's growing now a lot a lot, a lot of people say in the west coast i mean you have these sasquatch hunters who figure they're gonna kill it and they believe it's a physical being that hides in the forest what's your take on is this interdimensional or what are we dealing with here um i believe they're flesh and blood but with they hold some ancient knowledge uh whether it's uh, a vibration uh, you know perhaps they understand how to vibrate at different frequencies which can uh make them invisible interdimensional i would Definitely say that because of the visits I've had at home, right here in my living room. Um, uh, invisibility, I, I know is a fact because of all the physical contact I've had, which has been, I, I don't count the incidents. There's so many of them. I've been patting the head and poked and even even had that held over my face once. I, I hope it was his hand and not, you know, some hairy ass being stuck in my face. <laughs> but it's because I don't know. Um, but they're, they've always been very gentle and, uh, it's, it's funny, actually we had an incident, um, a while back, Dwayne and I were standing outside, it's late at night and this is something that we, we do, right? So we're standing there and all of a sudden I get a poke. I said, Oh, Neff's here. And Dwayne says, you sure? I said, of course I'm sure. How long have we been doing this? You're sure. Really, you got to ask me this, and, and he's wearing a, a cap. Suddenly, his his hat goes flying up in the air, and uh, I just laughed. Right? <laughs> so wow. you know, there you go. You believe me now? So. So when you when you're talking about uh, physical contact, are you? Correct me if I'm wrong. You, you're experiencing the physical contact, but you're not seeing them. Like they're not revealing themselves visually to you, but they're making their presence known by leaving a physical footprint, a physical handprint, they're touching you physically, like that kind of thing. Is that what you yeah. mean? Okay. Yeah, just like they're standing right there in full physical form. You know, there's, uh, you feel that finger or hand or, um, and they understand all the contacts too, of, because I all this contact for the longest time is happening outside. And finally, uh, one visit, and it was this winter, I just said it out loud, I said, hey, Neff, you know, you, you, you keep touching me, and it's always outdoors. Can you please do it in, in, inside? And he, he's very uh, um, compliant. He doesn't, um, he doesn't do things I ask as, you know, spur the, or, or at that moment when I ask it, but he will. And he did later on that night, and it's happened numerous times since. So when I, when I ask a question, they – they continually show me they understand the context fully of what I'm speaking about. So what kinds of questions are you asking them and what kind of answers are they giving you? Um, <laughs> well, the, that last visit, I asked about uh, this virus. I said, um, did, uh, was this, uh, what was the question? Was, uh, was this virus that's going around the world made by humans and they wrote um uh what they say uh bad humans your god whatever that term meant i'm not sure at this point um i asked uh well duane asked first he said uh, do you know what they're trying to do to us and they wrote same as us so i said are they trying to kill us all and they said yes and we, we've had a lot of nefarious activity going on there with uh, last visit. There, there's a Cessna that flew very, very low over top of that cottage about 10 o'clock at night. And we asked about it and they gave us a drawing showing some sort of maybe surveillance coming out of the front. And they wrote scared and they drew a picture of themselves and they put tears and wrote scared uh, on the bottom. And um, they said bad plane for us, meaning them. So they're, they're very, uh, you know, very vocal with the, with the English and, and the responses at this point. It's, it's phenomenal. So considering that, um, like you, you were saying earlier, that you believe that they have uh, much greater cognitive ability or intelligence than, than we do, which would 
you could make the jump to saying that they have then a higher consciousness or like a greater conscious awareness than we do as humans. So considering that fear or, or feeling fear <clears throat> typically lowers um, your, a person or a being's awareness and into a higher, into a lower vibration, um, what do you think that their intention is by, by giving you that answer? Because that, that's a concerning answer, right? So um, that would make maybe make you or anyone who heard that feel afraid but it doesn't seem to be their intention for us to feel afraid. So how do you make sense of that response? Um, trust built over the years that they're willing to give that information. Um, just the, the amount of experiences that we've had with them, they, they seem to be very, very comfortable with us. You know, they, they trust us. Um, you know, the, the visuals with myself, have been extremely minimal, but uh, you know they have their reason for that. I don't. I don't know what that reason is at this point. Um, do they do they uh, interact with uh, people you might bring there? Like if we were to use Sinead for bait, it would would they show up if if Sinead was there or somebody else? I'm willing, I have, uh, well, willing to be bait. I just wanted to go on record. <laughs> bait. I'm in. Well. We took, Chris, we took Chris Munch there. He's actually a, a filmmaker. He, there's a film out called uh, Letters from the Big Man. It's a Sasquatch film, and it portrays them as closest to the truth that they are, that I've seen. And that's why Chris got invited in there. Oh, and they, they showed him in a big way. Yeah, we were standing inside the cottage, and he was talking about uh, uh, hyper-dimensionality at the, at the time, and and a marble appeared out of thin air right in front of him and dropped to the floor. And he had images imposed on his camera. And, and we'd be sitting outside, and it's one of those dead still nights, and you can hear them walking right around us. You can, you can hear their foot, footprints walking around us. So, yeah, he got to experience quite a bit. And I've taken in um, other friends and family. I'm very, very uh, picky about um, who I bring in to the area. As far as the cottage goes, that's that's Dwayne's, and he is extremely um, untrusting. He, uh, he, the stuff that we've been through, which you know I can understand. We had a falling out at one point, right? Because of all the stalking and trespassing that's gone on there and harassment, it's been ongoing for seven years. So he's very, very, very wary. But sorry to answer your question, yes. I have brought people in and they do get experiences. You, you mentioned the writing, a, a strange writing. Do, do you, have you looked at it or do you, does it look like you see this alien writing or what, can you describe what's coming down if it's not written in English? What kind of uh, language are they using and, and why do you think they're using these strange symbols? Um, I, I've asked them questions about language before. And they, they, they've given both symbols. Try, they're obviously trying to convey some sort of message, which uh, there's something that keeps coming up. It's three dots in a triangle, and it's been consistent. I, I haven't figured it out yet. I don't know what this means, right? Um, but some other words that have been written, um, they, I, I don't know what the language is. Although I did ask a question um, about uh, certain words, you know, I, I'd have to look at my, my stuff there, but um, we were at the cottage once and I asked uh, about a certain language and, and they wrote the language and then they said, speak here, and they put an arrow, um, uh, implying that this, this, is the, this is the language that they speak at this location and I guess other languages, depending on where they are, right? But uh, yeah, the, the language is something that is, is very interesting to me, and I would love to find somebody who, you know, could perhaps uh, decipher some of this somehow. Well, um, you mentioned stuff going on in your apartment. Have you had them them in your apartment, or just things happening in your apartment? Have you have you actually come face to face with, uh, say, a being or something like that? I've I've moved a few times throughout this journey. At one point, I was. Uh, Good friend of mine, I've known him probably he's 30 years now, and he lives out in Brampton. So I 
uh, rented or rented off him for, uh, I guess I was there for a couple of years, maybe. And I told him when I moved in, I said, his name's Kyle. I said, hey, Kyle, you know, there's a good chance some crazy stuff's going to start happening. He was very skeptical, a very lighthearted guy. And he was actually with me the very first time I went searching for them up in the Bon Echo, Echo area. So it took them about three weeks. And the first thing they did was rifle his wallet on his dresser while he was sleeping. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, thanks, guys. You know, what's Kyle going to think? I'm the only other one here, right? And um, actually, sorry, that wasn't the first thing. The first thing was uh, there was a door in the kitchen. And I let my cat out. It goes to the backyard. He, he was crashed out the uh, file because he works at the post office, so he gets up really early. So he, you know, it was about 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night. So I uh, you know, go to let my cat in, made sure that door was closed and locked. And the, um, the light above the stove, I went to shut it off, and I hit the wrong switch. This is right when I just moved there, so I didn't know what everything was. I hit the switch, and the, the fan turned on. It was really noisy, so I shut it off quick, shut the light off, go to bed. So the next day he tells me, hey, you left the door open and the light on. And I was like, uh, no, I didn't. So that next night, I had a dream. Nefetia showed up in my dream laughing at me. So I knew it was him. And then that's when the, the, the wallet thing happened. Well, Kyle got something in that house that I haven't even gotten yet. And he was downstairs watching television across the room. And one of them walked floor to ceiling see-through uh, apparition, walk through the closed door across the room in front, of him, uh, in front of him and out through the wall. They gave him physical contact. They gave him telepathy, mind speak. Um, by the time I left, uh, they, they don't like smoking. Um, they flipped all his cigarettes upside down in his pack one day. And uh, uh, so he steps out front to have a cigarette and there's a, a garden box there underneath the big window. So if you're walking up to the front door, it would be your, your uh, left foot if you stepped over. But they actually, he called me up. I was you know, playing music with my friends. And he was all excited. They left a bare footprint. It wasn't a huge one, you know, a younger one. And they left him a bare footprint under that. But it was the right foot. So to, to do that, it, it's just very um, difficult to the way it was placed and that and this is something they'll do they are very good at uh, they know what you focus on they'll utilize that information to show their presence and as far as uh, my own experiences here in the you know at, at home um, I had something happen recently this was just uh, a couple weeks ago I, I went to I had a few weeks off because of this stuff going around and I started taking uh, walks in the forest and at the same time, I've been having doubts, thinking, you know, I wonder if I'm saying too much. Uh, I wonder if, um, you know, if I should, if I've done my part, if I should just shut up and, you know, and that's it kind of thing. And I come out of my, out of the forest, my car's locked. I have a couple of things hanging from my rear view mirror. One's a hand woven gift and others a piece of uh, obsidian and stone and uh, hanging from a, a rope. There was a, an incident that happened at uh, downtown Toronto when I was working one day. This was a few years back. And this piece that I had hanging from the mirror, um, I was sitting there talking on the phone to a friend of mine. And I said to her, she's a researcher too. And I, I said, geez, it seems, it seems like everybody's having activity around me except me. I guess I avert my eyes or turn my head. And suddenly I look and that piece is wrapped around the mirror. And I've hit it with my hand. I've jumped on the brakes. I cannot make it go around the mirror. So I was like, wow. Well, a few weeks back, or a couple weeks ago, I come out of the forest. I get in my car. And this is when I've been having these doubts. There's that piece wrapped around the mirror, just like before. They did it again. So it was two days, I think it was two days later, 5.30 in the morning. And I got up to uh, go use the bathroom. Um, I go to crawl back into bed, and my cat's laying on the bed, and I have this coffee table right here with a stone top that I fabricated. I was in that industry for 10 years, so I've had this thing forever. I know what it sounds like. So I'm laying in bed, and I hear 
I hear a double knock on the stone. And I have a couple of casts here with, with marbles on them. I didn't notice this at first, but one of them is by a, a lamp here. And I have three marbles placed between the toes. And I, I never put one on the baby toe. Well, I went to shut the light off um, a few nights back. And I, I'm thinking they did this when they did the double knock. And I noticed that one of the marbles had been moved over to the baby toe. So they, these little things that they do, very subtle, um, but blatant. Uh, most of their activity is very subtle. What are the marbles about? Like, why are, why are marbles such a common um, apport, I guess, when it comes to, to Sasquatches? What is that about? Why marbles? I think Nefetia probably picked up a bucket of them off somebody's property and just, you know, it's, e it's easy, right? But it's funny uh, because I've noticed too, a lot of people that are involved in this subject, so many of them are using marbles at this point. And marbles are showing up. I, I did an interview over the phone with uh, a guy named uh, Ronnie LeBlanc. He wrote a book called Monsterland. You know, he wanted to see if I was full of it. Um, ended up having this uh, discussion over the phone. It's actually a chapter in his book. And after we had that discussion, that, that same uh, weekend, he ended up with three strange marble incidents. He just tilled the, the, the side of his driveway. He had some dirt and he suddenly, suddenly he looks and there's a, a clean marble sitting on top and he knows that wasn't there. And then he was helping his father um, do some stuff at his house and they go to walk in the front door and his his dad suddenly goes, oh, watch, there's a marble right there. I don't know how that got there. And then they had a, a family picnic that weekend with uh, a bunch of relatives. And his wife had, uh, I think she said she cleared this area. And suddenly there was a, a marble sitting right there that she knows was not just there. So, All different sizes, all different colors? Um, yeah, you know, it's really not even about that at all. It's, it's about just how they present and, and how they, they, they know how we focus, they know what we're watching, they know what we pay attention to, and they will utilize that information to place something right where they know you're going to see it. Yeah. Yeah. That That's kind of relates, sorry, Grant, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, I, I was just thinking again about, you know, Grant was asking you earlier, why are they here? What are they trying to tell us? What is their message? And you were talking about how you could ask them questions and have them answer. So what, what are they here for? Like if they're able to, um, it seems, choose people like yourself who they know are not going to run away in terror or dismiss the experience and realize it's valid and, and you know, engage in communication with them. What is their larger purpose and how does this connect to what you were saying at the beginning of the interview that this has to do with consciousness? How does, it, how does the consciousness piece connect to their purpose? I believe at this point they may be um, first people on this earth. And, you know, I could be wrong. I, 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 it's, it's understood that all these drawings and stuff throughout antiquity there's there's been some crazy stuff happen on this earth I, I they they're dated back well at least written throughout history dating back to Gilgamesh um, they are so connected to the earth they are the the energy of the earth they they are one with the earth like nothing else they are so connected it's it's absolutely astounding um they have this consciousness this is how i believe they find us too right you know when i go for a walk in the forest and i come out uh, you know i think they're they're tapped into to here so they know where i am at any given time i even made a trip out to california and and we had um several incidents happen i even stuck my video camera out the window and i think i one of them showed themselves and you know, within a couple seconds time frame, um, I believe they are the original Earth humans. And they are connected to us, most likely through our DNA. I think we have their DNA in us, some of us more than others. Um, I believe there's people that do not want us to figure this out. Um, you know, I think Sasquatch would be the missing link to our, to our history. 
So they're choosing to remain on this planet, right? They're like, do they also exist elsewhere? I guess is my question because if they, if they're the first beings that were um, here on this planet, then they obviously have a very, very strong connection to this particular place. But can they go elsewhere? That you were, we were talking about interdimensionality earlier. Do they also exist on other planets? Do they exist in other realities, or is it simply, or not so simply? the multiple timelines and dimensions that are within our own planet here? Honestly, I cannot answer that, Sinead. I don't know. What I do know is there are, there has, there has been um, uh, cases where they've been seen coming and going from UFOs. That would be my question. Have you had any other related phenomena, like have you seen orbs or UFOs or yeah. anything else, or just Sasquatches? No, there's uh, definitely been orb activity happened with this. Um, I've witnessed them in real time and captured them on, on camera. Um, there's been uh, uh, five UFO incidents and uh, two of them happened September 4th and 19th of 2018. And one of them was while I was driving on the 400 just north of uh, Toronto with Pearson right there on my left. And they knew exactly when and, you know, the timing of it was impeccable because there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a pristine, uh, pristine day. It was about 1230 in the afternoon. I was driving a, a company truck and there was a transport just ahead of me in the, in the next lane to my left, a vehicle behind that. And there was a, I'm driving along and suddenly I notice there's a this shadow moving and it's moving in the same direction that passes and I see it envelop the, the 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 transport covers the whole transport and it's moving in the same direction and right away I'm you know I have that weird feeling that I get I don't hear a plane you know I'm expecting to see hear a plane and I'm right by Pearson right and I, I kind of stick my head out there's nothing there so I'm pretty sure there, there was a cloaked UFO that was put right in front of me for me to witness it. It was only about three seconds. And then it was uh, about two weeks later, I was up in the area where Neff lives. I was by myself. And again, it was pristine conditions. This was at night this time, dead still. So you can hear, you can literally hear a pin drop. It's that quiet up there. Um, I, I'm sitting there on a chair and watching the stars, beautiful up there, there's no light noise. I can see planes way off in distance, 30,000 feet. I hear their engines, no problem, trailing behind them. And then I see this light and it looks like it's a you know, big jet pointed right at me. And so I, right away, almost immediately, I noticed there's no flashing lights on this thing. So I stood up and I, and I watched it and it come closer and closer. And it passed off just to my right over the road I was on. I estimate maybe a couple thousand feet in altitude. It wasn't, uh, wasn't very high, but it was absolutely silent. There was not a sound from it. So it wouldn't be a drone or something. It was, it was just dead silent. I didn't see a craft because it was just a big bright light. And, um, and then up in that same area, after I'd had a fallout with Dwayne because of you know, some of the stuff that was happening, um, it was about 15 months I'd gone through this emotional roller coaster ride, having this yank out from under my feet because I was actually at a point of, I think it was about nine consecutive visits where I was having direct communication with uh, Nefertia um, speaking. He's right there and we're, he's speaking back and forth and, and this was absolutely phenomenal. My last one would be on my uh, video Above and Beyond um, from 2015. That was my last visit when uh, yeah. that got interrupted. Well, they, like I said, they waited about 15 months and suddenly I have a dream where I believe it's uh, Neff's father. He steps out from the forest on a road I was walking. I ended up shaking his, his hand, well, his two fingers because his hand was so huge. And then suddenly, uh, well, he steps back into the forest. I wake up and within uh, a few days, I end up with this new location given to me because it's all private land up there. It's hard to find the area. So I had this new location given to me and the very first three visits when I went back, I'm, I'm laying in my tent, I got the fly off. So it's, it's just meshed and I'm 
I'm watching the, the stars. I'm always looking for moving objects and, you know, seeing if any crazy maneuver is going to happen. And this object passes by directly overhead and gives off this absolutely stunning bright flash, just lights up space. And it's just it's like that. And, and it kept going. And then it happened the next visit and it happened the next three visits in a row. So I've had numerous incidents with the, the UFO stuff and the orb activity. Where did the orb take place? Um, at the cottage. I had, uh, she might kill me for talking about this. Um, I had taken a friend of mine, Sonia Zohar. She's been involved in the subject for a long time too. She, uh, I have a video on my channel where, you know, having a discussion with her. So I rented a cottage up there. This is during the time that Dwayne and I had, had our falling out. And I rented a cottage for a week. And we had, uh, um, it, was, uh, it was late at night, my back was sore. I left her in the cottage, I went walking up the, the driveway. This was, I believe it was in October. So, you know, there's no people around, it's very quiet. And my back was sore, so I laid down on the gravel road at the end of the driveway, and it's all surrounded by trees there. As soon as I did that, I hear a, a foot come down, right, right there behind my head on the gravel. And I sat up and I just gave a little chuckle. I said, hold on, I'll be right back. So I went and got Sonia. I said, come on, Sonia, you got Sasquatch. We grabbed a blanket, go to sit down on the road. And it wasn't long, it was within minutes. Um, and it, again, it was one of those dead still nights. We get this bluff charge. It was from a younger individual, but still a lot of weight to it. Running right towards us for just a split second. I'm like, I thought we were being charged by a bear, but. Um, it wasn't. It was one of them. And it, and it spun and turned at the last second, right when it was in our face, and just kind of, and then the sound disappears into nothingness. So we ended up walking back into the cottage because she wanted to decompress and, um, you know, just talk about what she just experienced. And we had a couple of candles going, a couple of tea candles, and then we had a couple of... Uh, battery operated candles you know, the tall cylinder ones and this is the light and there was a light in the corner of the room that we didn't catch on to at the time and i don't know maybe there's something going on with our minds there but um after our discussion this light in the corner of the room we realized was not a light that was in the corner of the room it was an orb that had come into the cottage to listen and when it left it was just like this, whoosh, this big whoosh, and all the lights went out, the, the tea candles and the two battery operator ones, and we sat in darkness as it left. That's so yeah. cool. That's so cool. And I, I have a question for you related to this. Um, forgive me if you already said this. My audio cut out a couple of times for some reason just now. Um, so just using the age-old you know, chicken or egg question, what came first, the Sasquatch or the UFO? The the um, the Sasquatch of the UFO. In in what situation are you referring to? Well, I mean, like, what were your first experiences with UFOs, or were your first experiences with the Sasquatch? Okay, actually, my experiences go all the way back to the crib. So, there's my my family won't talk about this. It freaks them out. It scares them. They're afraid of it. it, it you know, it's because we've had demonic activity in our home when I was younger things happened right um, there was I remember one story where uh, I was told I was in my crib and my parents heard me talking to somebody and I said it was my grand but you know I don't know and, and I grew up with many instances of uh, sleep paralysis something something is in that room is uh, you know I don't buy the whole neurological assumption. I, I think it's something interdimensional. And that, those were scary moments. And so uh, there's been instances throughout my life, you know, I've had uh, some once in a blue moon, there's a voice that said some words or um, so I don't know, I, at this point, I'm even pondering the thought that this is predetermined that I am in this position doing what I'm doing now. I can't dismiss that. Have you had near-death experience or like a tr major trauma event? A lot of experiences report that going back to birth or lately, you know, through their life. Um, 
I had a failed parachute, uh, survived a skydiving incident, June 7th, 97. And while I was sitting on the plane, I was like this. I was uh, sitting in a Cessna. I had my um, uh, instructor sitting right across from me. I wasn't moving. Suddenly, my shoulder strap is not. Something pushed it off, tried to warn me, and then my parachute failed. Wow. So, well, that, that was a traumatizing incident. As far as childhood, um, a lot of my childhood is blank. Tell me about the parachute incident, because if you are familiar with um, Jean Houston, uh, jumped out of a plane at 17. She's a big uh, guru. She's an advisor to Hillary Clinton, a spiritual advisor. That's how she started, by having her parachute fail. Did you have yeah. any sort of, uh, w when it failed, like what, what, what happens? Do you get uh, sort of leave your body or near-death experience or just fear? or and, and how did you survive it? Well, as I mentioned, something pushed my shoulder strap off. I still jump. It was my fifth jump. Um, when I, I, I didn't really get fearful till just before I hit the ground. Um, the connections go on there. Yeah. Uh, just before I hit the ground about maybe, maybe 60 feet above the ground, I pull my steering lines and I remember my friends kind of laughed at me because I, I yelled at, I don't like this. I don't like this. And, uh, my, you know, I pulled my steering lines, my feet kicked up in the air because it was a malfunction, malfunction shoot. And I come down on a flat rock, probably a good 60 miles an hour. You know, it, the, the speed was there, right? And I landed on my wrist. I fractured my uh, T7 vertebrae and crushed my wrist. Um, that, that sounds common. That's one of the patterns. I had another incident, too, that was a, a life-saving moment. I my daughter at the time was four. I was downtown Toronto. I was on uh, Richmond Street. And is that Richmond going west? Richmond goes west, right? And I was sitting at uh, Richmond and John. And this was about uh, it was a sunny Saturday afternoon. And somebody had stolen a minivan and they come flying down uh, John Street. And they ran the, they ran the light. And I, I've always been quick off the light. I'm just that type of guy. Something yelled in my ear. And I turned to my daughter right when the light changed. And I said, what? And just in that time, that guy fly, went flying through the intersection and killed the people beside me in the car beside me. Wow. I got stalled, That's stalled, just, yeah, stalled just long enough to save wow. lives. Wow. You've had so many extraordinary experiences. And I mean, I think... Um, this is making me think of, um, I guess, the general experience for, for many experiencers. I am an experiencer too, so is Grant, that there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about people who have had direct experience with the paranormal. Um, and for you particularly, you are not only the Sasquatch guy, you've had a variety of experiences through your life leading up to this most recent chapter. And with this recent chapter, you have people saying to you, there are people out there who are saying, for example, that your partner in this, Dwayne, that he's the one that's creating all the vocals, that it's a hoax, that it's not real. What would you like to say to those people about that? Like, how would you respond to that skepticism? Because I feel like this also di directly relates to consciousness in the sense that in order to be open to having experiences like this, you have to be open to your own consciousness expanding, your own awareness expanding. And if you're not willing to entertain that, you can't have these experiences. And of course, we live in a culture and a society where we are discouraged from thinking in certain ways that are outside of the box or outside of, outside of the so-called norm, when we all know there's no such thing as normal. So how would you respond to these people who say, oh, this is not real, it's a hoax, it's Dwayne who's doing these vocals? What would you like to say to that? Um, I completely understand the skepticism. It's it's too good to be true for most people. These these vocals are phenomenal. They're they're so clear. And, um, and, and Dwayne has been accused 
constantly of, of being the the one you know making making these sounds right and uh, i have recordings and i have them posted too of um one of them i i just got into my car to to do battery change she's standing right there beside me and neff yells out from uh, closer to the cottage um there's uh the, the the whole hoax thing at one point he had stated it was a hoax because of the trespassing and the stalking and the harassment this was this was the whole reason he tried to shut this down because of all this going on and we were at each other's throats for months and months i was like no way in hell you're you're getting away with this no way because you know it's real yeah after all was said and done um you know he apologized to me and i apologized to him for all the nasty things we we said to each other um but uh, as far as the evidence i ha i have the supporting evidence that shows it's not him and and like i said i've recorded every night there's there's no um there's there's all all the audio clips are real they're all authentic nothing's been doctored i have you know up to roughly 10 hour files from probably close to 100 visits now and i, I have everything i have all the audio i've i've submitted um I've submitted audio, I've submitted casts, I've submitted hair. This is all for science. I've given uh, countless descriptions of, of incidents going on, and science knows that they are interdimensional. They know they have abilities. Um, I'm, I'm uh, supported by Dmitry Bayanov, uh, science director at Darwin State Museum in Moscow. He's been involved in this subject since 1964. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, the whole thing with Dwayne calling it a hoax was to stop the harassment and the stalking, and it didn't work. It's still going on. So I'm forever having to uh, deal with that, those accusations. It's a good thing that this experience is so worth it for you, right? Because otherwise it might not be to go through all this harassment. So. On that note, thank you for, you know, your courage and coming forward and, and doing all this amazing research. There is definitely a special quality to your research because you are able to provide so much evidence and because it's important to you to provide evidence. That's something that really stood out to me when I saw your website. So thank you so much for that, um, for being here, for sharing, you know, your experience, not just personal, but also all your research, all the evidence that you've collected, what it's like to have this kind of experience and for talking with us today. And just for viewers, I, um, I'll just restate that your website is sasquatchontario.com. It's a beautifully constructed website. Um, the videos are really something and I really encourage people to go and have a look. So Mike, thank you so much for being here today. And Grant, as always, thank you for letting me do this with you and for putting this up on your channel. Um, we're riding his coattails right now, Mike. That's what's happening. We're riding the Grant Cameron coattail. So um, uh, thank you, both of you, for being here and for doing this. It was a great conversation. And hopefully we can talk again, because it sounds like there's a lot more to talk about. I, I just want to mention one thing of why I do this and why I, I have stood my ground, because I see the capacity that this knowledge has that this can change the world for the better this can put humanity on a on a path of healing and and this is why i do it and and i know that i speak the truth and regardless of what happens i know the sasquatch know i speak the truth and that's what matters to me agreed grant any I'm final honored to talk to you and uh hopefully someday sinead will get to uh, experience it and back up your story well, I'm I'm the bait. You're the bait. For that, so I have to. I, it's inevitable. I do have a. Um, we tend to do the visits in the winter, right? Because the the prints show up, and 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 most of the cottages are shut down. That's why. So it's nice and quiet there throughout the summer. Um, Dwayne's mom actually takes over the cottage, but I do have another uh, location up in that area that I make visits to, and yeah, you could. You know, we could always go pitch a tent there at some point, and they show up every time. Wow. Just, it comes down to how much they want to reveal their presence. That's it. Amazing. Amazing. I'm, I'm game 100%. <laughs> <laughs>
anyway, thank you both so much. Grant has to has to go, unfortunately, otherwise we could talk for longer, but hopefully we'll have to talk another time. Beautiful. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Okay, nice to meet you, Grant. Okay, pleasure. Okay.